Today's presentation is just going to be a very brief one on how to build community, community in your online class. And my name is Ariella St. Rose, um, and I work for Distance Learning Institute here at the University of Miami. So today's presentation will just go over what is community, why is it important, and the nine strategies that you can implement in order to create that community. I define community as the amount of connection and support that we feel with other people within a shared experience. And this feeling of connection and support helps to enable learning in any context. Building community is important because students are active learners and a large element of learning of a learning community is sharing perspectives and experiences to make sense of the information being shared. And part of the learning process involves discussion, reflection and collaborative teamwork. So students learn a lot from explaining their ideas to others and from doing activities that put them in a position to learn from their peers. So the first strategy is to let students get to know you. So Michelle Pekonsky Brock, who is a noted leader in higher education with expertise in teaching online, once stated that humanizing a course begins with humanizing the instructor. There's no single method for doing this. Some professors have more goofy or playful personas and others are more reserved. The point is to let students know your interests and your personality. And when students are comfortable with you, they'll feel more comfortable learning, participating and sharing in a class. And one easy way to do this is just to create a quick introduction video for your course. The second strategy to building community is to intentionally design your course in a manner that creates a space for students to check in with you and with each other. You can start your session with a temperature check to allow students the opportunity to share how they're doing. And two examples of these temperature checks that um, Harvard listed is having students describe how their week went with one emoji or asking them what has brought them joy this week. And these checks can be verbal or communicated through chat. You can also carve out time to ask your students if they have any announcements or celebrations happening. And you can also end the class with a closing circle to serve as a final check-in. And examples of closing circles can include using three words to describe what they learned today, sharing a question that they may still have, or just sharing one sentence describing how their thinking has changed during the class. The third strategy is to set and communicate clear expectations and norms. This allows students to know what to expect from you, your instructions, and their classmates. And I'm just going to show you some examples of expectations that you can set. The first expectation is for them to be present and engaged during the class. Tell them to try and free themselves from distractions and listen deeply to whomever is speaking. The second strategy can be to avoid interrupting others when speaking. And if they do, apologize for it. And this just plays into the netiquette of attending synchronous classes online. The third expectation can be to be open to learning. Learning new or challenging topics can be uncomfortable. So become uncomfortable, so sorry, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now, in more discussion-based courses, there are a couple of expectations that you can set to help create meaningful dialogue that can lead to a larger sense of community, according to Alexandra Sedlaskaya, the Assistant Director for the Center of Teaching and Learning at Harvard Business School. The first expectation is to pursue intellectual curiosity. Establish that you're all trying to pursue that curiosity, curiosity together. And if they have a question, they should ask it, even if they're afraid of how that question is going to come across. The second expectation is candor. Establish that everyone has different perspectives that are shaped by their diverse backgrounds and ways of thought. That means we'll hear different opinions that we've never heard before or that we disagree with. 
And this level of openness is to be expected in class. The third expectation is courtesy. Let students know that they need to voice their perspectives, listen to others, and respond with respect. Make sure that you're operating from a place of good intentions before you speak, and assume that your classmates are doing the same. We have to pursue our curiosity from a place of respect and kindness. The fourth expectation is courage. Acknowledge that it takes courage for students to share their perspectives and to listen deeply and understand perspectives that are different. Listening and understanding doesn't mean you agree. It's just a vital part of the learning process. The fourth strategy is to dedicate time for student orientation in your first synchronous class. So take time to discuss your course expectations, grading and assessments, required materials, and any relevant information. Going over this information synchronously will allow students to ask any immediate questions they may have. And make sure to introduce yourself to your students during the session as well. So this ties into the first point that we talked about, which is let, let the students get to know who you are. So talk about your interests and hobby in your, in your hobbies. This will help students become familiar with you and get to know who you are. And you can also have students get to know each other. This can have an impact on building community in the class. You can call in students and ask them to briefly introduce themselves. You can also put them in breakout groups and have them talk amongst themselves or make it an activity and have students share what they learned about their classmates in the main room or turn it into an assignment for them to submit later on. If you're not planning on having synchronous classes during your, um, your course, you can also create this as assignment on the, the discussion board for them to submit. Or you can just create chats and platforms such as Microsoft Teams. The fifth strategy is to support your learners through the adjustment period. So online learning may be unfamiliar, unfamiliar to some students and other students may be more accustomed to an asynchronous online experience than with synchronous ones. So some ways to support students going through this period are to one, be open to being vulnerable. So open up about any uncertainty you may be feeling so your students feel more comfortable sharing their own challenges. And two, prepare for silence. Students may need time before joining in on a discussion be prepared for these moments of silence. The sixth strategy is to ask students to set intentions to be present and engaged. It's very easy, sorry, let me go back here. It is very easy for your students to become distracted because they're using the same device that they typically use to check their email, social media, and more. Set these intentions at the start of the class. This helps to activate the student's metacognition regarding their presence in class, which supports their learning on how to learn. This will help students start taking responsibility over their own learning process. So here's a sample intention that I'm just going to read for you on the next slide. Um, I just wanted to provide a clear space for everyone to think about the intention. Let's take a moment to set our intentions to be present and to participate fully in this one hour class, even knowing that our minds may wander. Let's anticipate what we need to remain present. We might close browser windows, turn off notifications, move phones out of reach, and have a notepad available to take notes. Let's practice noticing when we are becoming distracted and remind ourselves of our intentions to be present. As we prepare to begin class, Let's close our eyes and take three deep breaths together as a group, and then rejoin the space as our full selves. The seventh strategy is to support learners who need to attend via audio only during your synchronous classes. So students who attend sessions using the audio only feature won't be able to see the videos or screen shares. So here's how, some tips that you can utilize for making sure that they get a more complete experience. 
The first tip is to make your slides available to students. So if they end up missing something, they can always go back later and clarify things. Two, refer to speakers by name so that students can follow the conversation better. Three, describe any visuals or slides that you may have. Four, people who join audio only won't be able to enter any breakout rooms. They will stay in the main session, which can serve as their own breakout room for audio only participants. The eighth strategy is to give opportunities for students to work in groups. So one great way of doing this is through the use of breakout rooms in whichever video conference tool that you're using. They allow students to establish closer connections with each other and help facilitate larger discussions when they return to the main room. Students can engage in their ideas, have debates, work together as a team, and problem solve in a more intimate setting, regardless of the size of the class. The ideal breakout room size tends to be between three and seven people, but this just depends on um, the teacher's comfortability and the student's comfortability with the tool. Um, and this, uh, the activity type that you're utilizing it for. And many traditional activities, such as discuss, discussing questions, brainstorming sessions, problem solving, and long-term projects can be done in breakout rooms. So regardless of the activity that you decide upon, it's also vital that you provide clear instructions on the assignment before students enter their rooms. Give students time to ask clarifying questions, or ask questions to check their comprehension of the task. Post instructions in a place where students can access them while they're in their breakout rooms. And be clear about when you're sending them to, them to these rooms, how long they have, and if they need anything before joining. Spending time wondering about what the instructions are takes time away from the groups to focus on the task at hand. The ninth and final strategy is to design your synchronous session to support students' engagement and sense of belonging. And here are some suggestions on how to do this. So for smaller classes, greet students by name as they join in. Include stretch breaks and sessions that are over 40 minutes. Think about assigning the students different roles in the breakout rooms. And these roles can include note takers, timekeepers, and more. Allow students opportunities for providing peer learning, such as facilitating group discussion, bringing discussion questions to class, and providing asynchronous feedback to their peers. And to help create shared presence, you can use these collaboration tools such as Google Docs, and the whiteboard feature of Collaborate Ultra or Zoom is also great at creating that shared experience. So these are my resources. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>